have you guys heard of LIGO and gravitational waves? Have you guys, are you going to find out about them now? <laughs> okay, so uh, one of the cool things about uh, what I'll be talking about is just uh, how a, a lot of interest has happened over the last month or so. And so you will find all kinds of various things that people have been doing with related, uh, that's related to the detection that we made. And so just while we may wait for more people to come in, if there's any, any more people coming in, I was just going to play this mu uh, music video that came out a couple weeks ago that... Uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Cool. It's only three minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. Let me just get my PowerPoint set up here. Yeah. I need to. How do I? Okay. Okay. Let's go back to see from current slide. Wait, this is the other one. I think it's down here. Yeah. And we go to that, yeah. And then if we do, there we go. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Awesome. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm C.D. Hoyle from Physics and Astronomy Department. And we're super excited to welcome, along with the College of Natural Resources and Sciences, Corey Gray, 
who is from the Lyman Observatory in Hanford, Washington. Uh, Corey's uh, an HSU graduate, uh, 1997. That's when I graduated. Yeah, yep. right, in physics and, and mathematics. And um, he was a member of, of NSF as well. And so we're um, thrilled that he could make time out of his vacation week right, <laughs> to uh, give this talk today. And he'll be talking about the discovery of gravitational waves, which um, no April Fool's joke is probably one of the biggest discoveries in physics that we'll see um, in our lifetimes. So let's give a big uh, round of applause and welcome to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, CD. Um, as CD uh, alluded to, uh, this was my, supposed to be my vacation. I was just going to come down and check out the big time, which is happening tomorrow. But uh, people found out that I was going to be in the area, and so I got recruited to give some talks, <laughs> to give a talk here at, at HSU, uh, and which it, that's what I'm happy to do. Um, so do, do, do you guys know that, uh, what I'm uh, going to be talking about as far as what a gravitational wave detection is and, and what happened? Like, it was in the news like about a month ago. Are you guys familiar with it? OK, cool. Um, so that, that's what I'll, I'll kind of go through a rough outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. And so I, I, I kind of would just want to give you kind of the groundwork. So I'll talk about uh, myself, just what, uh, how I got to where I'm at. And then I'll talk about LIGO. I'll talk about uh, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity very lightly. I'll just kind of go over just uh, the basics of it. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll focus more on the actual detection. So on February 11th is when we made the announcement for the detection. And the actual detection didn't happen until, or it actually happened months earlier. So that was, it was actually happened last year in September. But it took us uh, many months to, to, uh, to vet the data and just go through it and really be certain that we had uh, a real event. And so... Let me just move through this. So I, I don't think I'll get to talk here that often. Or actually, I, I do have this remote now. But yeah. <clears throat> but I like to look at this. OK. So as far as uh, uh, my connection with HSU, I, I went to school here in the late 90s, mid 90s. I got a degree in physics, a bachelor's of science in physics. And then uh, I don't know if, where's the physics contingent? Is it right up here? OK. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, there too. OK, cool. What? what? <laughs> Um, so uh, there's so much math in physics that you can get another degree if you want. So I got an applied math degree as well. So two bachelors of science degrees. Uh, and so basically right after I graduated, uh, I was doing the job search from Southern California. And it, in the LA Times is where I found a job announcement for LIGO. And it's actually, it was actually through Caltech. So Caltech and MIT are the two universities that run LIGO. And uh, they had an opening up in Washington State. So uh, Caltech and MIT run these two uh, detectors, these two observatories, and one is in Washington State, and the other one is in Louisiana, and I work in Washington. And so that's where I got my first job. Like I said, I graduated in 97. Um, as far as the work that I did when I first went there, uh, so I was a fresh undergrad. I didn't know really what I was going to be doing. Uh, but what ended up happening is that I got to be there at a good time because that's when we were building the actual detector. And so Pretty much within a week or so after getting there, uh, they had me suited up in clean room suits and, and turning wrenches, driving forklifts, operating cranes, uh, moving you know, several ton pieces of equipment around, and uh, actually building this instrument. And so I just have a couple pictures of some of the, the things that I do at work. Um, let's see. So here is an example of me inside of a chain. Actually, this is me doing yoga. This is LIGO yoga inside of a clean room. <laughs> so that's my head right there. And we needed to go into this chamber, and I needed to connect some cables over here. And so the only way to do that was to hop on this table and then uh, kind of needle myself down there and uh, make sure that connection was made. Uh, so that's some of the installation work that I did over the last couple of years. And it's not just me. We have a huge team of people. Uh, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration uh, is a family of about 1,000 scientists throughout the world who are working on LIGO. Uh, what else? Uh, this is just me taking some aerial shots inside of our big lab. Uh, and then me taking a selfie, of course. <laughs> and uh, when I was first hired, I was hired as an operator. And uh, we're the ones who run the machine. And so we have a team of about mm, nine operators at each observatory. And uh, back in the day, I was one of the young ones. So I was like some of you soon. Uh, recent graduates that are going to be graduating soon. I was like you guys. I was the fresh fish. 
but now it's uh, almost uh, 18 years later, and so I'm one of the old ones, and so I'm actually a supervisor now. So I, I run the operator team for the uh, detector up in uh, Washington State. Uh, and so these are some of my employees here. So these are operators, and we're just getting some training done for running the, the machine. This is just a really old photo from doing some surveying. <clears throat> Uh, so, in the big scope of things, where does this, where does LIGO fit, and where does the the first detection fit? Uh, it we didn't plan it, but the, uh, the, the te detection happened actually on the hundredth anniversary of uh, Einstein's presentation of his general theory of relativity. And so, it's just a trip to think that this event happened, uh, it just lined up so so nicely with that. And so, most of uh, Everything in that uh, that document, that paper, has been proven. I mean, the, just his ideas of what gravity is the, uh, was a huge thing for for uh, moving science forward. And and gravitational waves were just a tiny, uh, uh, like a sub subset of that that theory. And I mean, Einstein's a pretty uh, smart and out of. The, he's, he's, it's almost like he's an alien. The, the intelligence that he had, the the things that he was able to think about and come up with in his theory, because. He, he, there was no ideas of what black holes were when, when this came about, and, and he had uh, ideas of what those kind of objects could be. And, but back then, the, uh, I think he calculated, could we detect these kind of signals? Because they're going to be very, very, very tiny. And the only kind of objects they knew about back then were neutron stars, which are not as big and dense as black holes. And so because of limited uh, technology and uh, the not knowing all the types of sources are out there, uh, he, he kind of wrote off gravitational waves. And so, uh, luckily for us, we were able to prove, that, prove him wrong, or at least uh, confirm his, his mathematics in, in that theory. <clears throat> okay, so in, in contrast to Newton, who, who kind of, uh, you, you we're all kind of coming up with that idea of what uh, gravity is. It's like a force. You have that uh, visual of uh, somebody sitting underneath an, an apple tree and that apple falling on that person's head because of the Earth's force pulling that apple down. Uh, Einstein just had a completely different way of uh, uh, representing gravity. So instead of a force, all objects curve the space-time around them. And so you, this remote, that me or somebody in the back row, all curve space-time around us. But it's so small that we don't even see those kind of effects. You can see those kind of effects when you have really big masses. And so big, here's an example of the, the sun and the earth. And you, we have a, a grid there that's kind of showing you a visualization of how they're curving the space around them. And so sort of, this is a, a kind of a static example. I mean, you just have a big object in space, and it's curving uh, the space around it. And then you have an object that's kind of falling into that hole. Um, for the most part, there's not going to be any other effects other than that. I mean, there's going to be, uh, there could be gravitational waves, but they're going to be pretty small in this kind of an example. So you need to have a really much bigger objects. <clears throat> okay, and so going from Einstein and then uh, progressing to where LIGO is, you have to uh, put these people in your heads. Okay, so does anybody recognize, well, I guess people would recognize the person on the bottom uh, left. She's an actress. Uh, she was in the movie Interstellar. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, but if you have, uh, Kip Thorne, this, guy, this gentleman here, is one of the founders of LIGO, and he did work with that in that movie. So he, he helped with uh, developing the CGI for how the black holes looked and how the wormhole in that movie looked. And so he actually had some papers that came from that. And so Kip and Ron Drever and Ray Weiss are the three, I guess you could think of them as the fathers of LIGO. And if I was to say, uh, I'm not very familiar with Ron or Kip, but Ray is somebody who I'm very familiar with. He'd come to the site. Uh, I mean, he's got to be in his 80s, so he's up there. But he comes to the sites all the time. And you wouldn't know. He'd just kind of surprise you. And he'd be running down the hallway, and he'd be uh, carrying a big uh, stack of papers and getting ready to go do some work in the lab. But he's somebody who's, who's I mean, this is his baby. And I mean, he loves it. And he's, he's still doing uh, important projects for, for the, uh, the detector. And so if there ever is a, a, a Nobel Prize that's awarded for LIGO and the detection, it would most likely be this, this, this team here. So you should just keep in mind those people. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I would be able to get, uh, 
get a ticket to go to the auditorium when they announce the Nobel Prize, but I definitely would go to Stockholm just to hang out there and party in the streets when it happens, though. <laughs> so that's my plan. I don't know if it'll be this year, maybe next year. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to show you what our detector is, and we, we have, a, we have uh, two different ways of doing it. So this is a movie, and then uh, Ben and Garrett. They're, they, they actually made us an interferometer right here, so they're going to walk us through one that we have right in here for a demo. So let's look at this video. <clears throat> and before I do that, I should introduce some things. Okay, so this guy is a mirror, and that's a mirror. This guy is called, it's another optic, but we call it a beam splitter. This is supposed to be a laser, and then this is the, a, a diode or a detector, a photo detector. And so the light from this guy is going to hit this beam splitter, and then you're going to get two twin waves of light hitting those mirrors, and then coming back, and then you'll see the signal on the output where that detector is. But it's better just to watch it. <clears throat> and it'll go, I think it does it twice. It'll, it'll zoom in on certain features of it. <clears throat> And that's the beam splitter. And those are the waves of light that are split from the beam splitter. <clears throat> Hitting the mirror. For us, it's four kilometers away. That's where that mirror is. They're both four kilometers away. They recombine at the beam splitter. And then the interference pattern is what you're seeing right there from those two beams of light. And if you change the length of the arms at all, you'll start getting light at the output. And so that's what you're seeing right now. You're seeing the, the, the arm lengths change. So the light's traveling different uh, distances in each arm. <clears throat> and so this is a, a, an ideal instrument for looking for gravitational waves because uh, we can see very, very tiny effects very easily with this instrument. So if you're looking for signals that are really tiny, this is a way to amplify those signals and see them uh, uh, more easily. And so ways to see tiny effects. Uh, so a, an, an example of that is what we're going to show right here with this interferometer that we have. So I'll let you guys come up and uh, tinker with the mirrors. And then maybe we'll see some temperature effects and see what that looks like, too. Yeah. talking about uh, and then over on the side here um, this is going to be for us because we've kind of blown it up you'll see instead of just light and dark um, you'll see what's called interference fringes uh, and that's going to show where the light is coming in uh, and kind of interfering with each other um, and so what you can see here is I put this little one uh, on the end here on kind of a, it's a translation stage so it moves back and forth uh, but it's so sensitive that if I just stop touching the table and just turn this a little bit, you can see these fringes all start to move. And it's hard to see, but they're all going past each other um, because we're moving this arm just the tiniest, tiniest bit. Uh, and the wavelength of light is kind of what's, um, what's determining this. And that's so small, you can't, you can't measure that with, um, with most things. But here, because we're moving just a little bit, you can see a definite change in that pattern as it goes across. So that's you moving the, the, the mirror with that translation stage. So you're moving it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's just a tiny, tiny bit. I mean, imperceptibly, it's, I'm not even really turning it. Okay. Uh, it's just enough that it, it does affect it a little bit um, on here. And then there are other cool things you can do with this, which is, I think, what Garrett wanted to, to take a look at. Yeah, just well. to demonstrate what these things can do, um, what I can do real quick is, I don't know if you can see this or if the camera will pick it up, but I'm just heating the air. Uh, is it getting it? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of bend, bending the fringes just a little bit, and so you can detect things without even touching anything. There it is. Just a little bit. And uh, let's get that. So that's the temperature effects uh, that the mirror is seeing, and you're not even touching the mirror. Right, okay. not even touching anything. Yeah. Uh, and that's just because uh, we're heating up the air that the, the, the beam is passing through. And that changes the way that the beam passes through it. And you can measure just that, that tiny bit, just the heat from your hand does that. 
mm -hmm. um, and pr provides very visible effects. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and so uh, analogously to the heat from Garrett's hand, we're looking for uh, something else to move those mir mirrors. We're looking for gravitational waves from a, an event that's going to be far, far away. And where those, wherever that event's happen or coming from, it's going to pass through, the, uh, pass through space from a very uh, far distance and then uh, jostle these mirrors around and we'll see a similar effect. That's, that's the hope or that's the plan with uh, LIGO. That's what we want to do. Yeah, cool. Thank you, guys. And give them a hand for making this. <laughs> So they're graduating uh, physics seniors, and I, I, they should get extra credit for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, and so now I'm just going to follow up on uh, inter interferometers again. So this is another drawing of what an interferometer looks like. Test mass just means mirror. Uh, these mirrors are four kilometers away on these arms. Uh, and then we have a, a, this is a very cartoonish type of drawing. So there's a lot more things going on. Uh, the, the mirrors are actually on pendulums. They're, they're suspended from pendulums, and we call them quad pendulums because we have the actual mirror on the bottom, and then we have fibers connecting it to another mirror, and then from that mirror we're, uh, we have wires going up to some springs, and then those springs are actually suspended from springs on top of them. And so all of that is so that we can isolate that mass, that mirror, from other types of noise to us, noise that's... Uh, Examples of noise to us would be seismic motion or so earthquakes. So any earthquake that's magnitude six or more will definitely move our mirrors around. Um, trucks driving by on nearby roads, uh, big storm activity out in the ocean is definitely something that we also see as well. And so there's all these tricks, these engineering and physics tricks that we have to come up with to make, make it so that those mirrors there, those mirrors there are floating in space such that the only thing that jostle them around, hopefully will be gravitational waves. So we have to fight all these other noise sources. And so that's the name of the game with LIGO, just having all of these different, uh, these tricks that we have. Um, let's see, so we, can, we saw the fringes there. That, that was the green stripes that we saw on the video. Um, once you take that uh, light and you shine it on a, a photo diode or a detector, photo detector, you can do other things with it. So let's say, let's say we had a detector on here where the, the, the fringe pattern's coming out of. So if I had a, a little detector right here, um, depending on where the beam is, if the me as soon as the light hits that, that photo detector, it we could turn that into a current. And then once you have it uh, as a, a, a current or voltage, once you have that, you can do different things with it. You can uh, convert that, that current into an audio signal, or you could uh, graphically look at it. We could look at it in real time and see what the, uh, the light's doing in real time. Or this plot here, we call that a power spectrum. That's what this guy is. And so this isn't looking at real time. This is looking at uh, frequency, and then this is amplitude. And so these traces here are telling us what, uh, what the health is for both of our instruments. And so we call this the bucket, because this is the lowest part of the, uh, the graph. And this is where we, that's the window of where we expect to um, make detections at. So uh, the type of detections we're looking at are going to be something like uh, 40 hertz up to several kilohertz. And so when I say that, that's uh, how many times something oscillates a second. So something that's a kilohertz is moving, it's, it's vibrating a thousand times a second. And so uh, this is where we're looking for events for, with our detectors. <clears throat> Oh, okay, and then another thing. <laughs> so we have two detectors here. So this is where I live, up in Han uh, uh, Washington State, and then Louisiana's here. We have this note here about uh, 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 travel time. So gravitational waves also move at the speed of light, so that's, that's, that's a constant. And so if we ever happen to make a detection, on, or uh, uh, if we capture data that on both instruments and the time is more than 10 milliseconds, that would be something we would definitely rule out because uh, it's going to be something that's slower than the speed of light, so it can't be our detector. Um, so as an example, let me see. If we had somebody in the back row over there and then somebody on th this side over here, there's different ways you could uh, uh, look at that the, the, uh, kind of, there's different ways you can note that event. So if we had an event that was maybe symmetrically in between them, and the, the waves went at a point where that they both detected at the same time, that kind of gives you an idea of where in space that event would be. But if I had the event that started over here, like way over here at an extreme, 
and then this person detected the event first, and then the person over there detected it 10 milliseconds later. That kind of gives you an idea, uh, okay, there's something over that way, and so maybe we should have uh, optical observatories point their telescopes in that direction. So uh, we only have two detectors, but we can kind of get ideas of where possible events might occur. <clears throat> okay, and so there was two generations of LIGO, and so from about when I moved up there in 98 to 2010, we had initial LIGO. And so this graph is kind of telling us what our range was. So that's telling us how far out in space, how far out in the universe we were able to detect uh, um, possible events. And you can see that's pretty small. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, so there's only going to be a few types, a uh, few galaxies in this, this sphere, in this globe right there. Uh, so right now we're in the, uh, the middle of upgrading uh, our detector to uh, where we want to finally get to. And this, we call this advanced LIGO, and we're not there yet, but we've already finished our first phase. And so we just started collecting data from that first phase back in September. And so, like I said, we're not totally at the best sensitivity yet because there's still more things that we could do to uh, improve and uh, uh, make our machine better. So I think by about 2018, we should be done tinkering and we should be at the optimum sensitivity for our machine and then we'll be running on, on really long data runs, you know, co running 24-7 collecting data. But right now we're, we're not there yet, but we're still, we, we still can see much further out than what we did with our first detector that we had. Sorry? Yes? That's happening at both detectors simultaneously, so they both have the same scope. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so it was a very, uh, so the NSF uh, funds this project and so from 2010 to 2015 was, I wouldn't say it's stressful, but it was very uh, schedule, very heavily focused on schedule. And so we had to get, uh, uh, we, we had so many more administrators that were added to the staff so that they would make sure that we were on track and on schedule. And so we had to do that to get to where we are at now. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this is where most of the action is happening nowadays. So this is the control room for, uh, Washington State. Uh, this is where our, our, our uh, uh, this is where a lot of the <laughs> this is where most of this uh, my time is spent. So the operators usually sit in this chair right here. That's the operator for this day. This person is actually the one who is on shift right after me, and uh, on September 14th, and she's the one who uh, was on shift when the detection happened. So she, that's her claim to fame, and she's the newest hire. She's the the youngest operator that we have. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through that, but I, I, could, just, I could just say, yeah, <laughs> I'll show it, when I have the data, I'll show you, I'll talk about that. Uh, but usually when I give tours, we have tours all the time, and one of the things I always say that when I walk them into the, uh, the control room is I introduce them to, the, uh, to this Mac store, because everything here that we have are Macs that we have in here. And, what else? and then we have all these screens that just give us all types of information for what's going on the site, what's going on with the machine. Uh, that power spectrum uh, graph that we saw earlier, that's always running when we have a running machine right here. So every second, we'd see that spectrum, and maybe a line will pop up, or maybe a bump will happen. Uh, so that's just something that we watch, and just to see how the machine is behaving. Uh, and so, once again, I'm gonna kind of walk through what it would be like to make a detection, or what, what, what's, what's the, uh, uh, how does it happen in time? So let's go from an event, or like something out in space, okay, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so when I, I gave a talk here back in November, uh, and it's for American Indian College Motivation Days, and November is a couple months after September, so I, I already knew that we had a detection, and so I would have loved to have told those students that, dude, we just made a historical, like, detection, I could tell you, I mean, I, I wanted to tell those kids that and just, like, ex inspire them, but I had to hold my tongue, and, uh, yeah, Pim, thank you for inviting me to that. <laughs> And then um, this is, these are some of the slides that came from that. And so this is just kind of walking you through what, uh, uh, the, 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 the travel that the uh, gravitational, make, gravitational waves make from an event all the way to the detector. And so this could be a possible event. This actually was the kind of event we saw. <laughs> so you have two black holes merging into each other. So that's going to be very, very far away. And then those wiggles in space time are going to travel huge distances through the universe, and then at, uh, finally make it to Earth. And they're going to pass right through the Earth. But hopefully, if our machine is up and running, if, if 
both detectors have operators who are doing their best, I mean, doing their, their job. They should have both of these machines running and collecting data. And so those gravitational waves would pass right through the Earth, and these mirrors would oscillate just a little bit, and then we'd see that on the detectors that we have. So gravitational wave passes through the Earth. And this is inside that corner station in there. This is an, uh, one of the arms going in one direction, and then the other arm is right here. And so outside of this building, we go four kilometers to those mirrors, and they just uh, had that oscillation from an event. And then the light's going to come back here, back to the beam splitter right there. And then we're going to see it in a chamber over here. <clears throat> so those mirrors oscillate a little bit, kind of like what we saw with the, the, the temperature effects there. And so inside the chamber, the lights, that, similar to those green stripes, the fringes that we saw earlier, are going to hit these detectors right here. So these are all inside of a vacuum system. They're all on a seismic isolation table that has shock absorbers on it. So they're very still and quiet. And then the light goes to these guys. These are the detectors that we have. And that's me. That's me right there. <laughs> OK. And like I said, you can convert that light into uh, a current, and then this is what the result would be. So this thing is what we'd have in the middle of the control room, and we'd be watching that, uh, the, the, the power spectrum right here. Uh, that would be the red trace that we have. <clears throat> so that's kind of a background of what LIGO is, uh, what we're aiming to do. And then I'm going to kind of transition and uh, talk about the recent uh, uh, span where we were collecting data. So we call that observation, an observation run. So O1 is what we call it, yes. Yeah, yeah, so most of them we can account for. Some of, uh, some of them are definitely us putting uh, calibration, oscillate, ca calibration lines into the system. So those guys would be around 40 hertz. That's what these guys are. Uh, a cr an interesting one to look at is this one at 500. That's the resonance of the fibers that are, are holding the pendulum. So they, they kind of uh, have a resonance like a, like a violin string. And so uh, we call those the, that's the violin mode that we have there. And then there's 60 hertz uh, noise that we also have. And, uh, and this is already at 40 or 40 hertz. Yeah, yeah. And it's updating every minute. So we'll see a new one come up. And then, yeah. Yeah, and it's not great resolution. It's because we want to see it in real time. Yeah. <clears throat> And so if you had a machine running, uh, this is kind of another graphical uh, tool that we have to look at your sensitivity. How well is your machine running? Uh, the name of the game is to have the machine uh, locked or running and collecting data for long stretches of time because you never know when an event might happen. Uh, it could happen in the middle of the night. It could happen uh, on Christmas Eve at you know, 11 p.m. So you never know when it's going to happen. So you always, the operators have to always make sure the machine is up and collecting data. Uh, and so right here is a plot of one particular day that I, I, I picked. So this is uh, December 19th. And we're looking at uh, 24 hours. And so green is the Louisiana det detector, and red is Hanford. And this is kind of telling us how far out we can uh, detect uh, a certain type of event. And so this one we call uh, uh, neutron star, neutron st star uh, merger. So this is just one type of event. And we're looking at how far out we could see for those type of events. So a neutron star, neutron star uh, merger. Uh, generally, our detector is, a little, is always better than Louisiana's. And we can blame uh, the swamp, swamp and, and uh, all the lumber. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of people cutting trees around the site in Louisiana. So they're a little bit more noisier than we are. And so th that's one way. Our scientists are also cool. I, <laughs> I, like, I like our team. I like our team. No. But uh, we, it's, there is a competition between both observatories. So yeah. <laughs> but this is an example of just one type of event and the sensitivity that we have. So uh, this is looking at just one particular day. And then this is a similar, this is looking at the same day and looking at different types of events. And so the different colors are corresponding here. So you have uh, a binary neutron star. That's, that's the trace that we just looked at, 80 megaparsecs. That's a, a huge distance. That's a, a very far distance away. Um, and then we have a neutron star and a black hole merger. That's this guy. And then a binary black hole is this one. 
And the numbers here are telling you their, their masses, so 10 solar masses. So if you had a black hole uh, uh, that was 10 solar masses, that means it basically weighs, it has 10 of our suns in that black hole. That's how much it weighs. And, so, and then we have this one here, a 30-30 binary black hole. And you can see that range there, it's huge. So it's above 500 megaparsecs. So that's going way out in the universe. And so that's a huge sphere that we can make detections within. And so we always want to uh, uh, have the best sensitivity so we could see out far. And then we also want to make sure that we're running all the time so we can always be up and ready to, uh, to catch an event. <clears throat> OK. So now I'm going to kind of focus on what time? OK. So I'm doing OK on time. <laughs> so now most of it, I'm going to just kind of talk about uh, what happened on uh, February 11th and actually what happened really on September 14th. And so uh, did anybody catch this press conference? Uh, we streamed this back in February. Yeah, cool, cool. It was awesome. I mean, we, uh, we had uh, watching parties all over the, the, the world, and it was kind of cool to see. So uh, this, is, this woman is the head of the NSF. And then these are the people who are some of our, our top people for, for LIGO. And you might recognize Ray and Kip. Those are the uh, two of the founders for LIGO. Gabby is our spokesperson that we have. And then Dave Wrightsey, uh, at the beginning of the video, he's, a, he's the one who says, we detected gravitational waves. We did it. <laughs> so that music, that, and that vi video, that was him. Uh, so that was a very awesome morning. <laughs> And so in addition to uh, the announcement, we also had a paper that we also generated as well. Um, and, and so as far as what happened, OK, I'll do that in the next slide. But yeah, uh, so the outputs that, that came out was, was uh, the announcement that we had, and then this paper as well. Uh, I have the, the website for it here. The paper is actually supposed to be very uh, readable for the masses. So, and it's available. It's free. So you guys, it's only six pages. So you should feel free uh, uh, to read it sometime. And uh, you could get it online. And, or you can ask me, and I could point you to, the, point you to where to, to look at it. <clears throat> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, introduce that better. Um, OK, so this is, this is my tattoo. This is my new. <laughs> This is my new, it's become a prop. I didn't know this was going to be a prop, uh, but it actually is. So this is the actual data uh, from the event. So earlier, we were looking at power spectrum. So we were looking at stuff in frequency space. So like frequencies were on the, the horizontal axis. This is the actual data in time. So you're looking at time there. It's about uh, 0.4 seconds. And then half of that time, you could see that there's something that's going on right there. And that is the merger that we detected with our machines. And so other things that you could see is that there's a blue and there's a red trace. And the blue trace, the blue trace up there, is the data from the Louisiana detector. And the red trace is the Washington detector. And so you'll see that you could start seeing a wave start, uh, starting to form right about here. And you could see it get bigger and bigger and bigger in addition to that, the frequency gets higher, too. It gets faster and faster and faster. And then you get to this point right here, and that is where the merger occurs. So you had these two black holes, which were about 30 solar masses, 36 and 29. Uh, they were moving around in space. So these really, I mean, it's just it's unfathomable, unfathomable to think about what's going on here. So you have these huge objects. And then you have to also think of the speed that's involved, too. So, so these guys are moving at about 0.5 to 0.6, the speed of light. So that's a very, very fast velocity that these huge objects are, are, are doing in space. And so as they're moving, they're going to cause these huge ripples, these huge vibrations in space time. And we need that. We need these huge, violent events because they're, they're the ones that are going to generate these, these vibrations that we can detect with our, our machine. Um, so you can see that. Because of our sensitivity, this is where we start to see it. If we had a better machine that was more sensitive, we might be able to see even further out. But right now, for what we have, this is what we have right now. And so I mentioned the competition between both observatories. Uh, Louisiana's claim to fame is that they detected the single signal uh, seven milliseconds before we did, and then we, and then we, <laughs> then we collected it. But our claim to fame is that uh, we had better signal, because we were a bigger <laughs> signal here. So we had bigger amplitude, so. <laughs> OK. And so this is just breaking it down again. So just looking at what actually happened. So the horizontal axis here is time. 
and we're looking at both detectors. So we're looking at Washington, and we're looking at Louisiana, and then this is my tattoo. And then <laughs> if you could subtract out the, the, the actual event, I mean, using you know, Einstein's equations, relativistic equations, if you could subtract those out, this is what uh, you'd see, just noise. So normally when we're running our machines, uh, we're not going to see much going on at all. You're just going to see squiggly lines, and it's, uh, not gonna, you're not, it's not going to be very interesting. But you can see that the obvious difference between uh, nothing happening and when an event is happening. Uh, another graphical uh, uh, representation we have here is also uh, this one's going in frequency space. So you can see the event happens about here, and then it gets faster and faster and faster and faster. So it goes up in frequency up to about 300 hertz. And so those two black holes are these huge, big objects are moving close to the speed of light, and they're moving around each other at about 300 times a second, and then they merge into a bigger black hole. And then this black hole moves around, and then it's, uh, it has a rotation frequency about 100 hertz, so it's just rotating, and that, that's kind of where it's going to be until something else happens. But mathematically, if you look at the, the masses that were involved for both of these detectors, one was 36, and then the other one was 29, but the resultant black hole uh, was 62 megaparsec, I mean, <laughs> 62 solar masses. And so three solar masses is missing. And so that mass, three suns of, of mass, was totally converted into gravitational wave energy. And so that energy, that signal, is what we saw on, <laughs> on September 14th. <clears throat> okay. And now we can listen to that. Like I said, you could do, once you have uh, the light from our interferometers on the photo detector, you could do different things with it. So this is a way to listen to the, to the signal. So gravitational waves aren't sound, so they're actually just you know, the vibration of space time. But since we can, with our machine that we have, we can get that light and turn it into an audio signal. So this is a way to, for us humans to kind of see what the, or listen to what these events look like. It's better to hear it loud, but I don't want to <laughs> make anybody deaf. <laughs> uh, OK, so I'm going to play this. And it's going to kind of look like the, the earlier uh, slide that we had. And it's going to be looped. So we're going to see it uh, happen a, a few times, just so you could hear it. Uh, there's a low frequency one, which is the actual data. And then we frequency shift it so it's a little higher frequency. And you could hear it a little bit better. And it'll happen a few times. I could play it again, too. I'll play it one more time, but just to kind of think about it, I mean, we have these two detectors on Earth, and uh, if you could kind of think of ears, if you could think of if the Earth had ears, you could think of uh, the way your eardrum vibrates when a compression wave comes from any kind of sound. Uh, it'll move that eardrum, and then your, uh, your brain will convert that in, into a sound. Similarly, our detectors were just happened to, be, happened to be running, and then this event that's one billion light years away passed right through the Earth, and it caused our little eardrums on our detectors to move. So basically, those mirrors were moving. And so it's, it's just a trip to think that something so huge, big, and violent, so far away, that happened so long ago, uh, we were able to have these mirrors like move around because of that event. And it's just it's weird to think about. It's, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I'll play it one more time. Uh, okay, so that's the actual data. Uh, we can, there are some simulations that could kind of help you visualize what happened, so I'll play some of those, I think, in a little bit. Uh, th we've kind of already seen some of this stuff. So the first phase of uh, the signal is when the, these two objects are in spiraling into each other, and then they get to a point where the frequency gets, they're, they're you know, falling closer and closer into each other, and they get to a point where they merge, and then they have this bigger black hole that's ringing down at 100 hertz. And then these are the vo velocities that are involved. So the green one is, this is speed of light. And we're, uh, as they're going in time, it gets faster and faster and faster and faster right until the merge. And then, uh, then you have the, the, the new black hole that's formed. Okay. And then here is the video. One, I think I have two simulations. So, so on this, uh, you can see there's a bigger one and a smaller one. And then we're also going to see the actual signal here. So you can see it uh, in time. 
that's matching that. And you could follow it all the way to the merger right there. There's no soundtrack. So that's, that's 36, and this is uh, 29. And the colors are kind of representing the amount of space that's being curved by each object. And gravitational waves are coming out here. So those are leaving that system. This is going to pause right before the, the merger happens, too. And now you can see this is where the, the time is happening. Getting closer and closer and closer. It gets crazy right here. <laughs> right up to this point. So they're going so fast. They're going po uh, 0.6 uh, close to the speed of light. So it's 60% of the speed of light. So that's super fast, right to the merger there. And then you get this huge curvature of space time that happens from that. And then that burp, that big uh, event is what we caught. And so you can see these pink stripes. So that's where the event is leaving this, this, this uh, uh, event there. And these are the ones that we detected on our, our detector. So those things travel for uh, a billion light years and then finally got to, well, we needed to have Einstein born and then he needed to come up with his general theory of relativity <laughs> and then Ray needed to invent LIGO and then we needed to build LIGO and then it just all lined up to just happen just the way it did. <laughs> so we lucked out. And then this is another one. Uh, I think this is kind of similar to the movie Interstellar, just the way it looks. So this is what... Um, you're going to see a lot of weirdness that's happening around the black holes, and that's just the light behind these uh, black holes as they're merging into each other. <clears throat> yeah, that's the simulation of what it would look like. <laughs> if we could somehow be close enough to see this happening, uh, this is what it would look like, but we'd probably get torn to bits because of the <laughs> gravitational waves stretching and pulling us and stuff as it happened. And then that's the big black hole. That's the result. <laughs> uh, so the, bi uh, the big end, the big guy, <laughs> is about the diameter of Iceland. So here's Iceland. And so, so for perspective, that's how big that black hole is. So it's 52 suns. So this object here, if you could throw uh, 52 of our suns into that, that sphere right there, that's how big and, and massive and dense that black hole is that happened from this event. And so that's just perspective to, to kind of tell us, what, to give us an idea of what it is. Uh, yeah, 62 solar masses, yeah, the diameter, and did I, I think I went over most of this, yeah. <clears throat> And like I said, we're, we're not the only game in town. Uh, LIGO has the two biggest instruments that are running. Uh, we, like I said, we ran until January. And s from January to now, we, we are not collecting any data. We're, so we're actually working on the machine to get it better uh, so that for our next data collection run, uh, we can uh, hopefully make more detections and see farther out. And so. In fall, I think, is the latest that I've heard for that when that's going to start. And when that happens, Italy is going to join us with their detector, Virgo. And then GEO has a small one. I think that they're, they have been with us for a while, but they're a lot smaller. So I don't, uh, they'd, have to see, uh, they'd have to be a really big event to happen for them to see something. And then this other detector is happening within a mine in a mountain in Japan, and it's called Kagra. And they're, uh, I don't know, they might be two or three years down the line. They're, they're getting close. Uh, for LIGO, we also had, we had three detectors. We used to have two where I lived. But instead of having two of them, we used to have one with two kilometer arms. So it used to have a mirror here and then a mirror here. But instead of making the two detectors there, we just built it, everything for it and boxed it all up. And we were hoping we could get another detector built in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Australia was our first choice, but uh, because of uh, all of the financial crisis stuff that happened in 2008, uh, they weren't able to do it. But India just uh, made the announcement that they have the funding to do it. So we will have another detector somewhere in India. We, don't have, we have a few sites that are lined up for that. <clears throat> the days after. OK, so like Vince was talking about, what was the night like? Uh, I'll stay there. So like I said, uh, operators work on shifts. I, I happened to be working that night, uh, September 
September 13 at, I, I worked from 4 p.m. to midnight, and this was at a point where we weren't officially running. So we weren't running all the time. We were still doing uh, calibration work. We were still te testing other tools during the day when the scientists are there. And then at night is when the scientists would, we, we'd kick the scientists out, and then we'd uh, 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 start collecting data for the night. And so that day was a rough day because there's a lot of things that were going on during my shift. Uh, the beam splitter mirror was having these glitches that needed to be repaired. And uh, so that was one issue. And then somebody was just doing an, an experiment. But we were, I was able to lock up the machine uh, close to the end of my shift. And then I didn't get to, to take it to science mode, but I let the next person come in. So that was Natsuni, the girl that we saw earlier. And so she started at midnight. And so at 1.50 is when the event happened. And it was so early, this event, you know, it's, it's so fast. So she didn't know that it happened when she was in, in the chair. Uh, we have computers that look at the data all the time. And so when there is a possible event, uh, this, uh, the, the computers sent e send emails, uh, uh, global emails out to scientists all over the world. And so the first people to actually hear about the event were in Germany. And so, <laughs> so let's see. So it was about one, two, three, three fifty in Louisiana, and so they were able to reach that operator, and they talked to them, and they they, they asked, uh, "What's going on? Are you, is everything going okay? Is the machine running okay?" And they said yes, and luckily everything was going okay with our machine as well, and uh, and that was kind of the beginning of the insanity. So from September fourteenth until February eleventh, we had to uh, we couldn't say anything about the event. Uh, we had to actually vet the data, so that, that was a huge process that we had to go through. So we had to um, make sure that this was a true event. We had to make sure it wasn't something environmental. We have seismometers, microphones, magnetometers, all these other sensors that we can um, look at to make sure that uh, it can't be something environmental. Uh, but I mean, the fact that this was detected at both sites and within that 10 milliseconds is a big marker for telling you that this was a big uh, legitimate event. And, and also because of the size, the magnitude of it as well. So that, uh, the old fogies like me and some of the older Wiley scientists thought it was us. We thought that maybe it was an injection that we put in, that was, it was a test that we put in ourselves. But the younger guys who were kind of running the machine, guys and girls who were running it, um, uh, they knew that a lot of that, those tools weren't even ready yet. So, I mean, those are the people you, went to, you want to go talk to. And they, they said, oh, this is legit. And so as soon as I heard that from them, then I knew that this was going to be a life-changing thing. Because it was just, uh, for so many years, I was focused on just um, you know, turning knobs and, and running a machine and, and just doing stuff very focused and, and uh, managing uh, personalities and stuff like that. But then uh, once you find out that you're a part of history and uh, a part of the arc of, of science or for a big event like this, it, it changes everything. And so I want to thank uh, CD for inviting me here because this is the kind of thing that we need to work on. We need to work on being able to uh, you know, spread the news about this and talk about it to the public and just uh, get this out there. We need more scientists and other people to help us out and, and, and help us with work like this. And like I said, we only made the one detection. Um, in that paper that I have on here, there's also a, a reference to a smaller possible event in there. But it was pr the, the signal to noise was pretty low. Uh, so I think if we, if we didn't make this detection, that one we probably would have uh, called our first detection. But since this one was so huge, this is the one that we're really focusing on. And so from September to uh, uh, February, uh, we've already looked at a, a chunk of that data, and then there's another chunk that's still remaining. So we're still looking through some of the other data, and we can't really say anything about that yet until we, we go through our, our procedures to make sure that, that all that any possible uh, triggers in, or events in that data uh, is true. So there's still uh, a verdict to come out for this first run. <clears throat> uh, okay. Yeah, so the days after. So it was crazy. Um, I also got to, to be a part of the group that uh, worked on the announcement. So uh, there was all kinds of social media things, like people made Twitter accounts, uh, people uh, worked on the Facebook account. And, and, and then the, the way that we wrote the paper and uh, uh, rolled out uh, uh, all the, 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 the videos and stuff for how, how we were going to explain all that stuff, we, we spent a good month 
uh, working on that to make it so that it was uh, very easy to understand and also very available to the public. Um, so yeah, it was good to be a part of that. Uh, I'm half native, I'm half Sixaga, same with my sister, we're both uh, Blackfoot. Um, and so our mom is a speaker, and so one thing I was able to do since I was in this outreach group is that I was able to ask them whether I could uh, divulge this, this secret information to my mom <laughs> a few days before the event happened. And that was because I wanted to uh, have her translate the press release into Blackfoot. And so that's another cool thing that I got to be a part of with our, our announcement. Um, so yeah, so these are all front page papers. This is Caltech, a bulletin board in, in, at Caltech. And these are just uh, front page papers from around the world. This is uh, Obama tweeting about us. <laughs> And then this is, if you, uh, you should look this up on, online. So this is, uh, Brian Green on the Colbert Show, that was pretty good. He did a really good job. Uh, Brian Green isn't a part of LIGO. He's just a general uh, popular physicist person. But the person who made his interferometer, like Ben and Garrett, actually is a part of LIGO. So that's, that was kind of a cool thing. <laughs> uh, like I said, OK, yeah, I'm just going to talk about my experience here. Um, I talked about my schooling. Oh, and then I, I talked to the physics students earlier today, so I got to talk about some of the, the, this dungeon room that I, we used to study at back in the day. When I, when I graduated, there was only two physics students that, were, uh, that walked with me, and now I, I hear that there's 12 this year. Yeah, so it's, yeah, moving up. That's cool. None of, none of the professors are here uh, from when I was here, so that's kind of sad. <laughs> that, that's, it's sad because I'm old, that's why. <laughs> Um, and there's a, a several native uh, groups that I uh, was a part of when I was here. So Intercept, the Indian Natural Resources Science and Engineering Program, saved me. When, uh, when I was in Cypress Hall that first semester, I remember being homesick and wanting to call it quits and just wanting to go work in a movie theater. And, and luckily, I found this group, and they, they helped me out, and it was like having another family. So I think uh, groups like this are important for uh, students to have. And then. Uh, American Indian Alliance was another group that uh, I was involved with, and I met a lot of other family members from that. And then I sang on the student drum back in the day, too. Uh, and I talked about my internships. Yeah, OK. Oh, OK, so <laughs> I have a couple of pictures from my experiences here. So I think this was like an equation of motion lab that we had uh, back in the day. Uh, do you guys have, does that look familiar at all? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah, OK, yeah. And that's not digital. I had to use my phone and take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, this is me uh, uh, with the student drum and some fellow singers back in the day. That's when I used to have longer hair. <laughs> uh, this is Cypress Hall. These are some of my uh, uh, fellow residence hall people. <laughs> and this, there, there I am in uh, Washington, DC at the Department of Energy for an internship that I did. And this is at the Capitol, the White House, the White House. <laughs> and then this is just a lot of my crew here that uh, are, are part of my family. And that's, that's the reason why I came, uh, came here for my vacation, just to see a lot of these people that I haven't seen for a while. And so, yeah, a lot less, or yeah, a lot less white hairs on this picture. <laughs> that, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. <laughs>